Glad that you're here to be a part of our Ducks in a Row series. If you've been with us since the first Sunday of the new year, you know that we're talking about areas of our life that we typically think about during the new year, right? We're going to get our finances together. We're finally, you know, we're going to get out of debt. We're going to do these things. We're going to live on a budget. We talked about time. How many people say, I'm going to be more organized with my time. I need to be a better manager of time. And uh, uh, today we're going to talk about our physical bodies for the next couple of weeks. All of these things are predicated on a simple biblical worldview, and that is when it comes to your money and your time and even your body and your, uh, keeping your brain sharp and uh, honoring the Lord, that, that you're not the owner of these things, you're the steward. And so last week we talked about, for example, with time, making a priority, seeking God first. The sermon was really just three words, you remember? Big, you remember this? Big rocks First, yeah, how did you do? How did you do this week? Were you able to get those big rocks in first? Uh, for some of you, you've been doing this for years. You've been seeking the Lord first thing in the morning. And I hope that was an encouragement to you, an affirmation. Keep going. I hope you felt encouraged. For those of you that's a new thing, let's keep it going. Big rocks first. Today we shift our attention now for this Sunday and next Sunday to talking about our physical health. Okay, all right, all right. It's a guilt-free zone, yeah. And uh, uh, Paul has some incredible things. Actually, the whole Bible has a lot to say about our bodies. Uh, the problem is, I say problem, and you'll see why. Uh, the, to me, the text that best gets at the underlying scriptural, the doctrine, the theology of uh, understanding our bodies, the way we should think about physical health, uh, the best place that really illustrates it kind of hits it because he's, Paul's talking about something else, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So I want you to turn there, and I want to explain something. 1 Corinthians 6 presents sort of a problem because, um, uh, well, a, problem, uh, a, a pastoral, a practical problem. Let me put it that way. Here's why. We at First Baptist, one of the great things about this church is that it is truly an intergenerational church, right? We got folks from all points of the spectrum, cradle to grave. It's not like we have just one type of person. And they gather here for worship, and we have all things. Okay. As a pastor, I've got the Word of God, and I'm supposed to feed the flock of God the Word of God. I don't get to pick the groceries, right? I can only, I can only preach what's in the Word of God. So i got to preach everything. But as a pastor, I know that some things are very beneficial for a certain age, and there are other things that are less beneficial for them, but more beneficial for others. And the problem with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, it doesn't talk about the body in a, you should be healthy in your body kind of way. Um, it talks about the body in a, so don't unite the members of your body with a cultic Corinthian temple prostitute kind of way, right? And while that is uh, true and, and very important, uh, I thought it would be wisest to today, let's talk about our body in terms of purpose and then next Sunday, we're going to focus on the rest of this passage, which talks about our body in terms of purity. And while I think this is, this is of critical importance for everybody, it might be best next week if you're um, somebody who, you know, we, we, we have a, an appropriate age uh, for a children's church and all that stuff. Next week, you might want to uh, consider that just parent to parent. You know, I got, I got to take care of all the little sheep uh, in the, uh, the whole church. And it might be uh, 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 something that would not be helpful for them yet though it will be one day, but it's of critical value next Sunday uh, to talk about our bodies in terms of their purity. 
and we'll talk about that. And I think it'd be very helpful uh, next Sunday. So I just wanted to, I wanted to let you know kind of how I was going to approach it. This Sunday, the purpose of our bodies, and then next Sunday, purity, which may mean it'd be less helpful for children like fifth grade and under, and we have a children's church available, uh, but uh, critically helpful for everybody else. I hope that uh, helps. Why, why do I say all this? Corinth, man, Corinth. Where do we start? First Corinthians chapter 6. If you know, Corinth is a city in ancient Greece. It's a wild place. It's actually, geographically, it's not on a peninsula. It's not on an island. It's on a place that is impossible for English speakers to say. It's on an isthmus. It's on an isthmus. <clears throat> Nailed it. So, it, it, this place in the center of Greece, and Corinth, man, was every, in the ancient world. Oh, man, Corinth, you, you left that farm town. You left that one-horse town in Nebraska to make it big in Corinth, right? Because if you can make it in Corinth, you can make it anywhere. It's a center of trade. Ports are coming in and out, right? So people leave societal structures. They leave family structures, and they go off to make it in the big city of Corinth. It's a financial hub. Think Wall Street. You want to get into finance? You want to get into be a baker? You want to go to Corinth. That's where it's at, right? It's a center of entertainment. Think Hollywood. Think L.A., right? Corinth is where all, I mean, they have these big orators that would pay, they, they, they'd pay them big bucks to come into town and to, to do all this rhetorical uh, uh, stuff and put on these shows. And it was a, above all, it was a party town, right? It was, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was Gadsden. It, no, I'm just it was Vegas, right? I mean, it was, right? It, the, the idea is you got New York City, you got Los Angeles, and you got Las Vegas rolled into one. I mean, there was an ancient Greek uh, document that was uncovered. And in Greek, uh, there was a, a phrase, it said, um, what happens in Corinth? It did not really stay, not really, uh, that, that's big. But, right, so you got the idea? This is a wild town. This is sin city. And then the craziest thing happened. The gospel came to sin city. And people got saved. God got a hold of their life. Isn't that incredible? The same God that saved you, Christian, saved these Corinthians way back then. And they had the same problem. They found themselves now with a new devotion, a new loyalty, a new Lord. They had to live under the Word of God. The problem was their culture was so quote-unquote progressive, and I use that term uh, with, with knowing that it's in quotes. Their, their culture was such that it had come so unhinged from the cultural, uh, uh, traditional values that it looked nothing like. And you got all these Christians trying to figure out how to follow Christ in a culture that has lost its mind. And here's what happened over time. Watch this. Eventually, the church started to look a lot like the culture. Stuff sounds very modern, doesn't it? it sounds very familiar. So what do you do? What do you, I mean, what do you do with that? Well, they did a pretty wise thing. They actually wrote the Apostle Paul a letter. Paul is the guy who planted this church. He gave him a letter, gave him some instructions. We've lost that letter. We don't know anything about it. It's just referenced. They wrote him back, and they said, we've got a problem because we, we really don't understand some stuff. And Paul realized, oh, man, there's some theological errors. And what they were doing is they were taking the cultural slogans of Corinth and they were using them in this letter to, to basically defend the way they were living, particularly when it came to how they, how they treated their bodies. And so what I wanted to show you is the slogans, and, and we'll show you the slogans first, then I'll show you Paul's response uh, later on in the message. So first, the slogans. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, start in verse 12. There were two, two main slogans they used. One of them, and this is so modern, this, is, this sounds so American. One of them is, and this was a Corinthian slogan, hey man, all things lawful, all things lawful. All things are lawful for me. Can't you kind of hear that? Doesn't that sound like a, mo you know, I hear people, you know, hey man, uh, it's free country. It's free country, free country, bro. Like, I, you know, I, all things are lawful for me. Isn't that, that, that's, sort, that's sort of 2019 America. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, do what you want. All things are lawful for me. That was one. You need to know that, right? Oh, and that one's also a little tricky. Every good, every good, lie has a little bit of truth in it. And this is why this is, so, remember these are Christians that were confused by this. Christians saying this, all things lawful. Part of the problem is Paul came in and when he taught the gospel, he taught it correctly. It's not a legalistic thing. It's not a new set of rules. The gospel is not, hey, you guys were doing so great with the Ten Commandments, we've added a bunch more commandments because you really, you really crushed the first ten, right? No, the gospel is grace. And so, so, so some immature Christians were thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't, God will forgive me whatever I do. I'm under his grace. 
So all things are lawful. And the problem with that is, technically for a Christian, it's absolutely true. It's true. All things are permissible for me. All things are lawful for me. If you're a Christian, no, no law but love, no creed but Christ. I mean, all things, literally all lawful. And if that doesn't make your jaw drop just a little bit, I think we need to really examine grace. It's, tr it, it's, it's true. But you're going to hear how Paul uh, 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 rephrased it in a minute. But we'll get, we'll get to the biblical response to that. But that's the first problem is, hey, all things are lawful. And it seems like I'm now a Christian, so I'm under grace. So, hey, all things are lawful. Hey, man, all things are lawful. The second slogan and this was this such a great Corinthian slogan. Not only are all things lawful, man, it's natural. Here's their slogan. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. What's that, what, what's that getting at? In other words, hey, I've got appetites and there is food. Simple. And I've got an appetite for something and that food is put here to feed that appetite, right? So if I've got a particular craving... That food is there to feed that craving. Simple. God made, God made me with appetites, and boom, here's this food to feed this appetite. So transfer that to immorality, and they would say, if I've got a craving for a particular lust, I should feed it. Why? Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, man. If there's, a, if there's an appetite out there that you can find, that you can fill, fill it. Why? It's Corinth, bro. It's 19. <laughs> like, like, literally, you know. Come on, we're progressive. To me, it's so modern. And so, it's bad doctrine. And you're going to see Paul's clap back here in just a second. His response is, but it's bad doctrine. Listen to me carefully. Their bad doctrine of the body led them to misuse their body, and they left a lot of wreckage in their wake. And we do the exact same thing today. Let me say it again. Our bad doctrine of the body led them to misuse their body, and it comes down to their worldview, their doctrine. That's the same thing, your doctrine, your worldview. It came, it came down to that, and it, led, and it led to all sorts of danger. So we have the same thing going on today. If you're a note taker, I'll give you three ways you can, you can misuse your body, three ways you can improperly think about your body. If you're a note taker, write these down. The first way, that's very common, you can reject the body. That's number one, you can reject the body. Lots of ways to do this. Sometimes we aren't even conscious of it, but we reject our bodies. The Bible would say this is totally wrong, but this is a Corinthian worldview. Let me start with the first one. One improper view of our body is to reject the body. We do this in simple ways, sometimes without even knowing it. Uh, when you look in the mirror, right, what do you do? Right? You're, there are ways we can reject our body, criticize. When you look in the mirror, how many of you, when you look in the mirror, your first thought is, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> right? I mean, right? If you do that, that, well, that's actually the second one. We'll talk about that in just a second. But, if you, right? No, you don't do that. I don't either. Nobody does that. Well, you go to the mirror with the purpose of criticizing, right? You go there to find out what's wrong. Oh, this, uh, this is wrong, this is off, right? Ah, uh, look at me. Ah, uh, too, too fat, uh, too scrawny, too many zits, right? Not enough zits. I don't know what you're into. I don't, I, I, you're right. Fashion changes. But you're right. Whatever it is, what are you doing? You're critiquing. Don't you see in a small way? You're rejecting the body. And the enemy feeds into that. The enemy is telling, right? Can you imagine? You're a teenager right now, and you're trying to hear the voice of God, and instead you hear the voice of the enemy, right? Well, I'm ugly. Who told you that? Who told you that? That's not a scriptural worldview. What are you doing? You're rejecting the body. See? And we do, and listen, there, you can understand, this is, people who call themselves Christians do this, and they don't even know they do it in the same way that people who don't, who don't have a biblical worldview do it. Let me see if I can explain. And it's very subtle. One way of rejecting the body is to have a lousy view of your doctrine. I, I heard a minister say this. This was years ago. It stuck with me. A guy was like, you know, he didn't take care of his body at all, and he was eating just junk food, you know. And now I, I, he, was, he was looking, he's Doritos, he, you know, eating all this stuff. And he laughed. He made, we were at a camp, and he said, hey, my theory is I'm going to eat whatever I want. I can treat this thing like trash. Why? Because God saved my soul, and my soul's going to heaven, and this is just going in the grave. And I remember that. It was like 10 or 15 years ago. I remember thinking, one day I'm going to preach a sermon series at Coleman First Baptist Church <laughs> on heaven, right, so that you get this right. What was he doing? Don't you see? He was rejecting the body. 
wasn't he? He was rejecting the body. He was saying, I can treat this like garbage. Why? Because God wants my soul. God's interested in my soul. My body doesn't matter. That is not biblical. That is not biblical. That is, that is the opposite of biblical. I tried to think of what is the worldview that is the most opposite of biblical I could find. And I came up with Lady Gaga. <laughs> in 2013, she wrote a song called Do What You Want With My Body in response to, so, uh, she felt like social media was body shaming her and all this stuff. I'm going to read you the lyrics of Do What You Want With My Body and you tell me, is that not the exact same thing that this minister was saying? L listen, you can't have my heart and you won't use my mind, but do what you want with my body. Do what you want with my body. You hear that? Mind-body dualism. She's saying, uh, because this is what really matters, you do it, the body's just, eh. You can't stop my voice because you don't own my life, but do what you want with my body. Do what you want with my body. From the bridge, sometimes I'm scared, I suppose. If you ever let me go, I would fall apart if you break my heart. So just take my body and don't stop the party. <sighs> it breaks your heart, doesn't it? Because you hear somebody saying, well, my body is whatever. Because God just entered in my soul. You'd say, that's wrong, that's wrong. That's exactly what a lot of Christians think. What are they doing? They're rejecting the body. And whether we say, oh, it's because God's only interested in our spirit. And God's, what do you, where is that in Scripture, right? Okay, so don't reject the body. Here's a second error. Here's a second bad, do, bad doctrine. Rejecting the body. Then on the other, if you're a note taker, don't, let's don't reject the body. Then on the other side, the other error, perfect the body. Perfect the body. That everything, the body becomes a sort of end to itself instead of a means to an end. And this is, I'm talking about the body becoming an idol. Here's where we're getting into like vanity, right? Where we, we I mean, you know, it's got to be a, a perfect 10 and the, and the chiseled, the bodybuilder and all this work, right? And I'm, I'm talking about hours and hours to primp for the perfect selfie, Right? And then hours and hours of Photoshop after that, right? What are you doing? Isn't it something interesting? In an attempt to perfect the body, do you realize what you're doing? You're actually rejecting the body. Did you ever think about that? You're Photoshopping and you're correcting. Why? Because th this isn't good and it needs to be perfect. Social media did not create this bad doctrine. It amplified it. Social media is not the problem. Social media is just kerosene on whatever fire. Fires that are good, that warm. Fires that are bad and destroy. Social media just amplifies it, right? It just puts it out. That's all it is. It puts it out there, right? And so, and so now you're comparing to others, and this is a perf perfect the body. So the goal is not to reject the body. The goal is not to perfect the body. So, so and to be fair, I, I think this is a very small uh, percentage, though if that's you, I, I hope this is encouraging to you, I hope it's challenging and helpful, but the vast majority of us are not, not rejecting the body, and we're not perfecting the body, the vast majority of us do this third wrong doctrine, and that's just sort of neglect the body. Right? It's not that we're out trying to reject it, it's not that we're trying to perfect it, we just sort of neglect it. Eh, you know, I mean your heart's been ticking this whole sermon. I hope that continues. But you didn't, I mean, just, right, just pump by pump, you didn't think about it. Every one of you has been breathing. Your lungs, in, in, this is amazing, involuntarily, you've been filling your lungs with air. There's not a single person in here who has a notification on their phone. Hey, yo, breathe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whoo, glad I, glad I turned that alarm on. <laughs> you, your body's just filling with air. And have you thought about it? No. Why? We just sort of neglect it. In fact, you can prove it. You don't, we take it for granted. The only time we think about physical health is when? When we don't have it. When we're sick. See, your, your car has a check engine light, right? You know that thing, you, you, you fix it by putting a piece of black electric tape over it, right? <laughs> Solved, right? That's how we treat our bodies. Our bodies don't have a check engine light. So when we get sick, often that's the check engine light. Say, whoa, you need more rest. You need to take, take better care of yourself, right? So what is the correct attitude? Not reject, not perfect, not neglect. The correct attitude in keeping with a sort of rhyme, respect. Respect our bodies. Now. Here's where we're at the massive fork in the road. Because so far, I don't think this is shocking to anyone. We should respect our bodies. We should take care of our physical health. Ah, here's the fork in the road. This is why I look. We, we should be healthy. Why? Why? 
You ever think about this? Like so far, I don't think anyone would disagree with me. In fact, there's been people who have built multi-million dollar industries on, hey guys, don't reject your, I'm, I'm thinking Dr. Oz and Oprah and all this stuff. We shouldn't, sh body shaming is wrong and, and, and just be who you are. And the, you know, the Dove campaign, all that, that's, that's all good, that's fine. But my question is why? 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 We should be healthy. We should be more mindful. We should all be healthy. I agree. Why? Why? I got on this kick this week, like, why? Why, why is physical health of any value? Because people are like, oh, because it is. In fact, I had my annual physical this week with my doctor. My doctor, he, he came in. I'm like, sit down. I got some questions for you. Hey, have you ever considered what? Like, why? Why? In a metaphysical sense, why is health valuable? He's like, uh, I, uh, I didn't really sign up for the, I'll ask the question. You know, right? And I, right, and he, he was like, you know what, that's a, that's a great question, right? Okay, so here's what I did. And if you're a nerd like me, you can't shake a question like this once you get on it. Why? I mean, why is, because we all know it is. My question is why. There's a massive fork in the road as to why. So I did what any scholar would do. I Googled, <laughs> why should we care about our health? And I read through so many blog posts and so much of it. They just needed an English comp teacher, like 101. I mean, a lot of it lacked a, a thesis statement. But why should we care about our health? And over and over again, over and over again, the, the blog post would come back. When I asked the internet, why should we care about our health? The overwhelming answer was this. We should care about our health so that we can be healthy. To which I would re-Google, right, but that's my point. Why be healthy? To which they replied, we, so that we can be healthy. Because health, right, but my point is, why is it important that we be healthy? Oh, I see what you're asking. Okay, because being healthy is important. <laughs> right? You understand? Over and over again. So if we asked, and watch this, if we asked, <clears throat> the massive fork in the road, if we asked to Totally different worldviews. Take um, Bill Nye. You know him as the science guy. He is uh, an atheist who is very hostile to the claims of Christianity. He believes there is no God. When we die, six billion years from now, we'll be a fossil, right? He is a scientist, and he's a very good scientist. Take another scientist, Dr. Francis Collins. He is right now your director of the National Institute of Health. He is the director, and it's been for years, National Institute of Health. An incredibly good scientist. He is also a, va a, a strong, avowed Christian. Loves the Lord with all his heart. Believe we were made in the image of God, right? Take these two worldviews, both great scientists, very different answers to why be healthy. And I watched some of Bill Nye's stuff, and he was debating this. Very interesting. The best a secular worldview can do is very different than the Bible. A secular worldview would say the following. You should be healthy when you boil it all down for two and mainly and only that I could see two legitimate reasons. Number one, Bill Nye would say, because it doesn't matter. After this, it's lights out. Your body's in the grave, your worm food. But in the meantime, you should be healthy, number one, so that you can live longer. Not bad. And number two, so that during those years of life, you will, like, feel better. Does that make sense? So health is important because, A, you're going to extend the length of your years, and during those years, you'll feel a little bit better before you die. I am going to make the case that while those sound reasonable and the Bible is not against living longer or having better physical health just for no other reason than you'll feel better, I want you to see that those are woefully insufficient and utterly impoverished as a theory of health. Why be healthy? So that you'll live longer. Long, longer? Longer, Bill Nye? Longer? Dr. Bill Nye? You know a lot more than I do about science, but this seems awfully dumb to me. Longer? In six billion years, we're going to be fossil fuel. And so our life is a moment. And the whole goal of health is to extend it from a moment to a moment and a, moment and a half. For what? Yeah, but during the years of your life, health is important so that you feel better every day. Oh, so live for pleasure. Avoidance of pain. That's it? That's the goal of life? Well, when you put it like that. When you, that you're putting it like that, right? But if that's it, to feel better. And isn't, isn't it almost worse if you... Uh, if the point of health is to make you feel better, and then after this it's lights out, you die, being healthy and happy is almost make, makes the joke of the brevity of life even crueler. Did that make any sense? In other words, it's like, make your life so happy, yeah, so that you should dread death even more. Because it's so short. I'm not making sense. I'll try again. Uh, 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 it, 
Have you ever had a vacation that is so good, you almost couldn't enjoy it because you knew you were going to have to leave? Am I the only one that twisted, like, that I would ruin a vacation? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, this place is awesome. I'm miserable. Why? Because we got to leave Friday. You can't enjoy it. If life is it, if that's it, and we're dead and we're in the grave, then a good life is almost even more cruel because you can't enjoy it knowing that we're going to be fossil fuels. That's it. It's insufficient. Why be healthy? The Bible would say you should take care of your body. Starting today, you should have better health. Why? Look at the clapbacks. Look at what Paul offers. Hey, man, all things are lawful for me. Yeah, but you were made with a purpose, and so not all things are helpful. Not all things are beneficial. That's really, really important. Paul says, you were made for a purpose. And the purpose is not just feed all your appetites. Eat what I can. Eat, eat, eat what I can get away with. Live how I want. Destroy my body. Why? And Paul's saying all things are helpful. What does he mean by helpful? Helpful brings up the concept of purpose. Have you ever thought about this? You only know the difference between whether an object is good or bad based on knowing its purpose. You ever thought about that? You define objects as good or bad solely based on their purpose. If you come to me and be like, hey man, I heard you got a new phone. Yeah, it's garbage. No, nah, bro, it was, like the latest, it was like the latest model. What do you mean it's garbage? A lot of people have this phone, they, they love it. No, nah, man, it's junk. Really? Yeah, man, all week long, I, you know I've been roofing my house, yeah. So I'll take my phone up there and I've been smashing roofing nails to nail in every single nail with my phone. This thing's garbage, man. It doesn't hold up. The screen's cracked. Once I hurt my hand with this thing, the phone's garbage. You'd be like, I don't think a, a hammer is really an app on this device. Like, like, I don't think you understood the purpose of your phone, right? So is a body, is, are things helpful for the body or not? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is the purpose for the body? Hey, all things are lawful for me. Yeah, but you can get addicted to stuff. You, he says, I will not be dominated by anything, or I will not be mastered by anything. Sure, all things are lawful for you. Christian, you're free in Christ. I agree. But there's an unhealthy way you can become obsessed with food that it gets into an addiction, or, 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 or in reverse, it can get into an eating disorder. What's going on? It has the power to master you. So we got to be careful about how we treat our bodies. And the biggest of all is verse 13. When, when Paul hears, hey man, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Those things belong to this age, and God will destroy both one and the other. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You can't just say, sometimes I get cravings for a certain type of food, and God gave me an appetite for food. Boom, there's food. Food is to be consumed to feed this appetite. So if God gave me a craving for a certain type of lust, I should indulge. No different. Paul's saying it is different because a question of purpose. The stomach is created to be fed. Food has one purpose, to be eaten. But your body is not a stomach. You are more than just a big appetite. Your body is not one big appetite. It's not food for the body, uh, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. You, got, you need to change your slogan, Paul says, it's the, to this. It's the body for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He says, that's a big difference because now we've got some purpose. The body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. That's the purpose of physical health because your body is not for you. Your body's for the Lord and the Lord is for your body. Your body is not for feeding your cravings. Your body is not so that you can take a perfect selfie. Your body is not for prolonging life. It's not just for gaining health. Your body's not for you at all. It's for the Lord. Your body has a purpose. It has meaning and great worth because you're, through your body you glorify the Lord. That's why you don't have to reject it. That's why you don't have to perfect it. That's why you shouldn't neglect it. Why? It's got a purpose. And that's why, whatever the world says, whatever the enemy whispers in your ear, that's why your body's beautiful. That's why your body has dignity. That, and, and the whole thing about body shaming, it's incredible to me. Here are people with a secular worldview who reject God, who say don't shame the body. But if your whole life is just to live longer and to be more healthy, you should shame the body. It's incredible to me. And yet, someone with a secular worldview would go, no, 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 you should never do that. I'm like, yeah, but your doctrine actually leads you there. But a Christian says you were made in the image of God, and that's why you can't shame the body. Your body's not for you, it's for the Lord. Christians actually have a doctrine that leads them against the neglecting of the body. 
So what am I saying? Your body has a purpose, and therefore it has meaning, it has great worth, because through your body you are to glorify the Lord. The reason we should have physical health, have you ever thought about diet and exercise, not as a New Year's resolution, but as worship? Because I want my body to be able to glorify you for as, good as, I, for as long as I can. I don't want to be healthy just for health's sake. I want to be healthy so I can share the good news of the gospel. I, I think you should exercise so that you have enough energy to be cheerful and helpful for others. I think you should get enough sleep at night because it's hard to love your neighbor as yourself when you're miserable and cranky. It's like, oh man, I, I, need, to, oh, I need to pray more. No, you just need a nap. That's the most spiritual thing you could do. And when you exercise, you feel better. When you feel better, you might be more likely to love. Don't you see? We're doing this not so not we can get physically fit and we're going to get healthy. And we're gonna, in fact, if we do it just for that, that's vanity. And it can lead to you're doing it for your own glory. To take your medicines properly and care and listen to your doctor and all that. Why? Because your body's for the Lord and he's got a plan for it. See? When I was in New York for 14 years, we would sometimes have mission teams come up and help us for a week in the summer. It was fun. A lot of them actually came from the great state of Alabama. They were a great blessing. They would come up, they would lead sports camps, or they would lead vacation Bible schools. Um, one of the differences in New York life is nobody drives anywhere. They walk everywhere, up and down the subway steps and up and down everything. And uh, so these teams would come up, and we had a great team come up from nearby, Rainsville, Alabama. It's great. It became really good friends with these folks. And if any of them ever see this on live stream, hey, First Baptist Rainsville, I love you. And uh, uh, a great, great group, and they came up one year. We had a great time, and they planned a next trip. And they did, they did these classes. Before you could come on a mission trip, you had to take classes all spring for the summer trip. And who knows, maybe Coleman First Baptist, maybe God's laying on our heart. I, I hope that we'll take mission trips. We Peru, and we just got back from uh, South Asia, and all, all this exciting stuff. Maybe one day we'll, we'll, we'll go to New York City and help with church planning also. Very exciting stuff. Anyway, they do these classes you have to take before you come up. Kind of orientation so that everybody on the team is prepared. And I called the pastor. This is like in March. They're coming in June. And I'm like, hey, how are those classes going? He goes, oh man, they're tough. We lost another one to a broken ankle. <laughs> Tell me about these classes. And he said, well, last year we worked every, every Wednesday night, we'd stay after church and prepare our vacation Bible school crafts, and we would get this Bible teachers together, and they would prepare, and we would get the people doing sports camps, and we'd make sure they had all the equipment. This year we realized we took, we, we took only half the time to do that, and the remainder of our time we're doing PT, physical training. Really? He said, yep, we got stairs in the back of our church, and we run the stairs. Because we realized last year, the biggest reason we weren't as effective as we could be is we weren't in physical shape enough to run up and down all the different stairs in New York. And we realized our bodies need to be in better shape to glorify the Lord. I was like, that's what I'm talking about. Here's people of all different body types and all different body shapes saying, I'm going to take the body God's given me, and I'm going to glorify the Lord with it. That's the best use of a body. And, we're looking, and, and that, that poor lady, she got a broken ankle, and I thought, God's going to, he's going to honor that. Like, it, it blew me away, but I thought, that's an illustration of what we're talking about. It's not, your, your body's not here on earth to consume appetite, appetite. You're not a stomach. Your body's for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. What does that last part mean? We'll close with this. He, I, I want you to see that no matter what body type you have, you can glorify the God. Because you can glorify God with your body. Because I realize there's going to be somebody here whose body is ravaged right now with chronic pain. How can you glorify the body? Don't you see? How can you glorify God with your body? Don't you see? When you're in pain, don't you see how that drives you to dependence on God? And you can glorify God in your body by knowing that when you walk through suffering, you drink that cup of suffering in communion with your Savior, Jesus, who suffered in his body. And it's going to draw you closer to him. It's not easy. It's not an easy. I don't mean glorify God in the body like, hey, I'm in a lot of pain. Oh, well, God is good. I mean, walk through that road with him. He loves you. You say, well, what, what if I have cancer? How, and, and cancer is ravaging my body, then I can show you, you can glorify God in your body by showing the world how a Christian deals with this with hope. What if I'm on my deathbed? What if I'm at the end of my life? How can I glorify? You can show the world how to die like a Christian dies. With courage and hope and faith. And doesn't the world need to know that? Don't they need to hear that? Don't they need to see that lived out? We've all known saints who've gone on to heaven, and before they died, they died. And you go, that's how you die as a person with great hope. See? Glorify God in your body. 
Because your body's for the Lord. And watch this, the Lord is for the body. It means Christ died for you. He didn't just die for your soul. He died for you. Body and soul. I can prove it. I don't have to prove it. Paul proved it. Verse 14. Christ died in his physical body, and on the third day he did what? God raised him. God raised the Lord. Yeah, Jesus, right now, this is crazy to think about. Let's blow your mind. Right now, wherever Jesus is, he has a physical body. He has a glorified physical body, and he will also raise us up by his power. God is for your body because he's going to raise it up. We're not, just, we're not just floating off to heaven as a disembodied soul, and our body is trash, worm food. No, he's going he's to raise up that body and glorify it. Now, how does verse 14 help you right now? Chuck's going to come and lead us in a time of response, but I want us to really think long and hard about this. How does knowing there'll be a bodily resurrection, and if any of you need to go back and watch the Heaven series, go back and watch this. You will have a glorified body forever in the new heaven, new earth. Jesus had a body, and he kept the scars, didn't he? Right? So, so there's, the, Jesus, sometimes they couldn't recognize him, but other times they could recognize him, which makes me believe that your glorified body will be glorified, but it'll still be you. Does that make sense? People are going to know you in heaven. You're going to know your loved ones that are in Christ in heaven. Okay? So you, bodies. This is the best I could do, and it's not a perfect illustration. I talked to several people at the 8 a.m. service, and they said it was very helpful, even though we understand it's not perfect. And it's not perfect because this illustration is about reclamation, and th this is really about resurrection, but this is as good as I could do. You know how right now it's really popular and trendy to have, like, reclaimed antique things, right? So, like, if you're building this wall, it's so cool to have, like, that wall, that wood was from, like, a barn in the 1800s and like now it's here and it's been like it, it's still old but you don't want it to look new I mean in a way right or it's one thing to have like you know a brand new piece of furniture it's another to know that it was your great great grandmother's and it's 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 kind of roughed up a little but the roughed up part is almost like what makes it more beautiful does that, does that make sense so this is the analogy I came up with what if I came up to you today and I said show me your Bible and you showed me your phone I said your other Bible and you pulled out a paper Bible. I said, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. And I said, hey, I happen to know something about the future. Don't ask how I know, it's just a sermon illustration. But I know in the future that Jesus is not gonna come back for another 200 years, and so 200 years from now, in the year 2219, I happen to know that that Bible you're holding right now, it's actually gonna become an heirloom in your family. R really? Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in 200 years from now, your great, 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 whatever great grandson Check this out. He's actually, he's going to become a Christian too. He's going to convert and become a Christian because every Christian is a convert. There's no such thing. No one's born Christian, okay? So he's going to convert too, like you did, and he's going to become a Christian. And 200 years from now, he's going to, um, this is going to be passed down in his family. That, that Bible, yeah, that you're holding right now. And here's the amazing thing. It's going to be 200 years old, and um, he's going to, when he thinks about it, he's going to think about the legacy of faith that his great, 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 whoever you had and he's gonna he's gonna hold on and here's the thing here's the craziest part he's gonna get married and um he is gonna have his own family and and in the living room of their futuristic house hovering on a hover table they're gonna display now he's gonna re he's gonna like rework it and have to do some binding in this new way but he's gonna display your bible in the living room of his home 200 years from now How would it change how you treat this physical object? It sort of gives it a little more dignity. Yeah. I mean, I, on the one hand, you, you wouldn't just tear out pages. You wouldn't treat it like garbage, would you? Never. You treat it with respect. But here's the other thing. You wouldn't just put it in acrylic. You wouldn't put it in, a, in, in, in an acrylic holder either, would you? No, you'd use it. Why? Because everybody knows what makes this thing so precious is that it's been used and marked up and prayed through and cried and the tear stains on it, right? That's what makes, that's what makes it. So you, so you wouldn't neglect it and you wouldn't reject it, but you wouldn't try to perfect it either. You would use it for what it's supposed to be used for and it would become beautiful in its glorified state. That's what God wants to do with every one of your bodies. That's why Jesus kept the scars. We always think glorified body means perfect. It doesn't, it means beautiful. He, he came to die, and so he kept the scars. Wouldn't you think a glorified body, they would have buffed that out with a, like a, like a, like a car? 
You know, let's get rid of that dent. Let's get rid of that scar. He kept it. Why? Because he came to die. And because he was doing with his body exactly what he was supposed to do, those have now become glorified and, and beautiful. And who of us don't want to see them? See, right? You with me? So what do you do with your bodies? You do exactly what you're called to do. You glorify God every day with your body. So church, let's get physically healthy. Why? For one reason. Because our body's for the Lord and the Lord's for our body. That's it. There's no other reason. There's, there's no shame. There's no comparison. You can do it in whatever body you've been given. Let's do the things that will help us best glorify God in our bodies. Because the Lord is for the body and the body is for the Lord. Let's pray. God, grant to us a clear understanding of our bodies. And God, forgive us where we have bought into the lies of the world, thinking that you only care about our souls and our spirits, and you care nothing for these bodies. And God, we look forward to the day when our bodies are resurrected as yours was, Jesus. That is our sure and certain hope. And I pray in the meantime, we would use our bodies in the manner they are supposed to be used for your glory, enjoying you, doing acts of love and kindness, using them, as we'll talk about next week, for purity, not immorality, because you are for our body, and our body is for you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.